Section 14 of the Watergate Report, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 1, Section 14. 3. Federal Bureau of Investigation. Another technique of the White House staff was to obtain derogatory information about individuals from investigative agencies such as the FBI, and to disseminate the information to the press by way of selective leaks. Caulfield referred to the process of disseminating derogatory information about individuals to the media as a Nofziger job. Caulfield testified that he meant that Lynn Nofziger, whose talents in that area were much greater than anyone else around the White House, would make the derogatory information available to reporters to do stories on the individuals. Nofziger explained that he merely provided significant political information to reporters and that there was nothing unusual about doing this in either political campaigns or in government itself. Some examples of White House use of the FBI to obtain information on individuals for non-law enforcement purposes are related below. In the summer of 1969, while John Dean was working at the Department of Justice, he testified that he was directed by Deputy Attorney General Richard Kleindienst to call Cartha DeLoach, the Deputy Director of the FBI, and obtain from him some information for the White House relating to the foreign travels of Mary Jo Kopechny, the woman who died in the Chappaquiddick accident. Dean said he called DeLoach and subsequently related the information he obtained to Jack Caulfield at the White House. Dean testified that on another occasion, while traveling with the President, Haldeman requested Larry Higby to direct the FBI to do an investigation of CBS News correspondent Daniel Shore. Higby, in turn, informed Hoover of the request, and Hoover proceeded with a full-field, wide-open investigation that soon leaked to the press. Dean testified that, as a result, Fred Malik announced that Shore was being considered for an environmental post in the administration, and that the FBI investigation was merely a preliminary background check. H. R. Haldeman had no recollection of the purpose for ordering the FBI investigation, but in light of other activities going on in the White House at the time, the question arises as to whether there was a valid basis for requesting the FBI investigation of Mr. Shore. Alexander Butterfield stated that both Haldeman and Ehrlichman requested about eight FBI checks on non-appointees to the government. Among these checks were Frank Sinatra, Helen Hayes, and Daniel Shore. In August 1971, Jack Caulfield testified that he first learned of the upcoming Newsday series on B.B. Rebozo from Pat Henry, an FBI agent in New York. Caulfield said that Henry subsequently provided him with more information that served as the basis for Caulfield's memorandum on September 10, 1971, to John Dean. In this memorandum, Caulfield claimed that there had been a discreet look at the newspaper's publication calendar, and that there was no indication that the series of articles would appear during the month of September. There is no evidence that any formal FBI investigation was launched into the Newsday publication of the series on Rebozo. Finally, Caulfield testified that he obtained information from the FBI about Emil D'Antonio, the producer of the film Millhouse. Caulfield testified that he was asked to run a name check with the FBI on D'Antonio by John Dean. Despite the fact that D'Antonio was not being considered at any time for any position within the administration, Caulfield received a summary from the FBI of what their files contained and noted in a memorandum to Dean that if Larry O'Brien got behind the Millhouse film, we can, armed with the Bureau's information, do an Offsiger job on D'Antonio and O'Brien. Finally, the success of Milhouse apparently reached such proportions that Caulfield recommended to Dean the release of D'Antonio's FBI derogatory background to friendly media. Caulfield also recommended in this memo that a discreet IRS audit be done of New Yorker Films, D'Antonio, and Daniel Talbot, the distributor of the film. 
Caulfield testified that Dean turned down Caulfield's suggestions, but the fact that Caulfield was able to obtain access to FBI information so easily clearly poses a serious threat to the rights of individual citizens unless carefully curtailed by legislation. 4. Department of Justice A. Antitrust Policy There were some suggestions made by various staff personnel to use antitrust policy to intimidate and coerce the large media conglomerates into giving more favorable coverage to the Nixon administration. In an October 17, 1969 memorandum from Magruder to Haldeman entitled The Shotgun vs. the Bible, Magruder discussed the problem of perceived unfair coverage of the White House by news media. The real problem that faces the administration is to get this unfair coverage in such a way that we make a major impact on a basis which the networks, newspapers, and Congress will react to and begin to look at things somewhat differently. Magruder suggested the Antitrust Division is a potentially useful agency in curbing media unfairness. He recommended that the administration utilize the antitrust division to investigate various media relating to antitrust of violations even the possible threat of antitrust action i think would be effective in changing their views in the above matter jack caulfield also recommended that the antitrust laws be used to curb the media in a memo to john dean on november second nineteen seventy one caulfield with the concurrence of lynn nofziger recommended that antitrust action be taken against the Los Angeles Times in response to their publication of a new street edition. Dean requested an opinion from his aide, David Wilson, on the proposed request, but no further action was apparently taken. On April 14, 1972, the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department, in fact, filed an antitrust suit against the three major networks. It is as yet unclear whether the articulated desires of some White House staff members expressed above had any effect on the decision to file the suit. B. Internal Security Division The Internal Security Division, ISD, of the Department of Justice was a repository of domestic internal security information. Howard Hunt testified that Robert Mardian, former assistant attorney general in charge of the internal security division forwarded fbi investigative information on daniel ellsberg to the plumbers over in the white house after he left the isd mardian also arranged to provide crp with intelligence information on potential demonstrations mardian defended this practice in his testimony as practical and proper when asked if the type of information given to CRP was also available to the public, Mardian responded, It was available under the guidelines to any entity that might be the subject of violent civil disorder and the appropriate people that should know of the potential so that they might arrest it. James McCord testified that the initial request for additional intelligence on demonstrators originated with Robert Audle, CRP's Director of Administration. In a memorandum to then Attorney General Mitchell, Otto outlined CRP's need for additional intelligence on potentially violent disruptions at their Washington, D.C. office or at the Republican National Convention. Mardian said that Mitchell concurred in this opinion and instructed Mardian to make appropriate arrangements. Mardian called John Martin, chief of the ISD Analysis and Evaluation Section, on May 11, 1972, to tell him to expect a visit from the CRP security people. Subsequently, CRP security chief James McCord was directed to contact Martin to obtain the needed information. After confirming the appropriateness of the meeting with his superiors, Martin met with McCord on May 18, 1972. The first meeting lasted for almost an hour, and then McCord, and or his assistant, Robert Houston, met again with analysis and evaluation staff on May 25th, May 31st, and June 2nd, 1972. The files of the ISD shown to McCord included domestic intelligence from the FBI and other related sources, according to McCord. 
mccord reviewed these fbi reports including one which he claimed talked about a democratic contender's finance operation one such report dealt with as i recall a funding operation that was reported in which the mcgovern committee purportedly funded a so-called barnstorming tour of several members of the vietnam veterans against the war any violence to be directed against crp by any individuals or groups might properly be disclosed to crp security personnel and appropriate for law enforcement officials however the free flow of information out of the internal security division to the president's re-election campaign appears to have exceeded the agency's appropriate function john martin said that no such intelligence information was provided to any democratic candidates because the democrats didn't ask for it this is ironic since this committee received testimony that e howard hunt was planning a violent demonstration for the democratic convention use of the isd personnel to conduct interviews for the white house during the kleindienst confirmation hearings has been documented earlier in this report c parole board on december thirtieth nineteen seventy one charles colson received a telephone call from former u s senator george smathers smathers called colson to request his assistance in releasing calvin covens from prison prior to the may first nineteen seventy two date set by the parole board as smathers explained to colson i really think that politically it's a very astute thing to do and it would not do anything but get gain credit and commendation for the president i can guarantee that there's no backlash to this at all colson explained to smathers that he would get to work on it and immediately sent a memo to john dean saying the attached is much too hot for me to handle colson explained to dean that in view of smathers decision to support the president next year we had better attend to this and not let it slip covens was released from jail on january sixth nineteen seventy two and subsequently donated thirty thousand dollars in cash to the finance committee for the re-election of the president coven stated that his release from prison four months prior to his parole date was due solely to his health condition and was the result of personal intervention by the warden of the facility at eglin air force base there is no evidence before the committee that covens was released for political reasons or in exchange for a contribution except for the ambiguous chain of events noted above the calls referred to above however indicate the willingness of white house officials to attempt to utilize supposedly independent government agencies for political purposes five secret service some misuse and attempted misuse of the secret service has already been noted in the wiretap of f donald nixon in order to avoid political embarrassment to the president however there were additional instances during the course of the nineteen seventy two campaign when white house officials either sought or used information from the secret service obtained during the course of their official duties in protecting the presidential candidates on october sixteenth nineteen seventy two stephen karolikas an assistant in the white house wrote to charles colson concerning information that he had obtained indirectly from the secret service the information that was passed on to colson was that a secret service agent was upset because senator mcgovern had stayed at the home of an individual in massachusetts who was allegedly a subversive Karolikas also wrote that the agent had promised to continue to pass along similar kinds of information as a result of this information colson had dick howard instruct john dean to check out the facts on the suspect individual's background dean asked pete kinsey of his office to check with the white house fbi liaison to see if there was any helpful information there is no indication that this request was ever followed up any further on another occasion a top official at the secret service brought john dean a small intelligence printout regarding senator mcgovern the secret service official left the printout for dean and said i thought that this might be of interest to you dean recalled that the printout had to do with senator mcgovern attending a fundraising function in philadelphia along with alleged former communist supporters dean said he took the document to charles colson 
who indicated that he was interested in the information. Dean said that Colson later told him that he had made arrangements to have the information published. Colson took the teletype report and had Joan Hall, his secretary, retype the information contained therein. William Lambert, the same individual to whom Howard Hunt had shown the forged diem cables, stated that he was contacted by Colson and shown a short teletype-like wire of about twelve lines in Colson's office after the Democratic Convention. He also recalled that the cable said something about a fundraising meeting at an individual's house in Philadelphia. This political utilization by the White House of information obtained from the Secret Service during the 1972 campaign was very similar to earlier efforts by the White House to obtain information on individuals from the investigative agencies and was an abuse of power by the White House during the 1972 campaign. Some steps have already been taken in the Secret Service to ensure that such incidents do not occur again. It is critically important to safeguard the independence of the Secret Service in order that it properly fulfill the protective function with which it is charged. 6. Other Agencies A. Federal Communications Commission In his October 17, 1969, memorandum to H. R. Haldeman, noted above, Jeb Magruder recommended that to cope with the alleged media bias, the White House begin an official monitoring system through the FCC as soon as Dean Birch is officially on board as chairman. If the monitoring system proves our point, we have the legitimate and legal rights to go to the networks, etc., and make official complaints from the FCC. This will have much more effect than a phone call from Herb Klein or Pat Buchanan. Charles W. Colson also prepared a memorandum with similar objectives for Haldeman on September 25, 1970, in which he summarized the pertinent points of his meeting with the chief executives of the three major television networks, concluding that they are very much afraid of us and are trying to prove that they are the good guys. Colson recommended that he pursue with Dean Birch the possibility of an interpretive ruling by the FCC on the role of the president when he uses TV, as soon as we have a majority. I think this point could be very favorably clarified, and it would, of course, have an inhibiting impact on the networks and their professed concern with achieving balance. In the White House Judiciary Committee transcript of the September 15, 1972 meeting, President Nixon discussed with Dean and Haldeman possible FCC problems for the Washington Post when its television and radio stations applied for license renewals. Haldeman. The Post. Unintelligible. President. It's going to have its problems. Haldeman. Unintelligible. Dean. Unintelligible. The networks are good, with Maury coming back three days in a row and unintelligible. President. That's right. The main, main thing is the Post is going to have damnable, damnable problems out of this one. They have a television station. Dean. That's right, they do. President. And they're going to have to get it renewed. Haldeman. They've got a radio station, too. President. When does that come up? Dean. I don't know, but the practice of non-licensees has certainly gotten more... President. That's right. Dean. More active in the... this area. President. And it's going to be goddamn active here. Dean. Laughter. Silence. These examples demonstrate the tendency of individuals in the White House to attempt to use supposedly independent agencies to achieve political ends. The following example shows how the tendency continued into the 1972 campaign. B. Action, formerly the Peace Corps and Vista. Jeb Magruder wrote to Ken Reitz, director of Young Voters for the President, on November 28, 1971, that action is an agency that we should be able to use politically. Magruder recommends that a meeting be scheduled with Joseph Blatchford, Actions Director, where it should be suggested that he do a lot of speaking on campuses and in high schools. 
he identified well with younger people and has the kind of program they like to hear about we used their recruiters who talked to four hundred and fifty thousand young people last year advertising program public relations effort and public contact people to sell the president and the accomplishments of the administration we should be involved and aware of everything from the scheduled appearances of actions recruiters to the format and content of its advertising thus the value of governmental agencies to the incumbent running for re-election was recognized early by crp this use of the incumbency is discussed more fully in a later chapter of this report h public relations in the white house one introduction during its first four years the nixon white house initiated a wide variety of public relations efforts directed toward re-electing president nixon in nineteen seventy two among the more successful of these efforts were one letter writing campaigns two direct mail operations and three the organization of citizens committees in response to specific issues while public relations activities are an integral part of politics and campaigns some of the activities initiated in the white house resulted in some deceptive and misleading practices which are described below two letter writing the letter writing campaigns generated by the white house were designed to give the impression to the recipients of the letters of a broad base of support for positions advocated by president nixon while the letters also served as a vehicle for publicizing the administration's positions in various matters on october eleventh nineteen sixty nine h r haldeman wrote a memorandum to jeb magruder in order to program of sending letters and telegrams and making telephone calls to the senators blasting them on their consistent opposition to the president on everything he is trying to do for the country this program needs to be subtle and worked out well so they receive these items from their home districts as well as other points around the country this memorandum initiated the white house campaign to steal criticism from republican senators goodell piercy and matthias Haldeman's handwritten notes from the bottom of a memo from Magruder to Haldeman on October 14, 1969, note that this campaign against the moderate senators was being carried out with the awareness of the president. In part, Haldeman wrote, This was an order, not a question, and I was told it was being carried out and so informed the president. Haldeman apparently wanted to keep this letter-writing campaign against the dissident senators secret, for he wrote across an October 16, 1969 memorandum from Jeb Magruder, this should be reported orally, or at least in a confidential memo. Other letter-writing campaigns, with letters sent to influential senators and to the letters to the editor column of newspapers, were initiated to support the nomination of G. Harold Carswell to the Supreme Court, and to support the president's speech announcing the invasion of Cambodia in May 1970. Shortly after the letters supporting Carswell campaign, a discreet letter-writing operation was set up at the Republican National Committee by Jeb Magruder with suggestions from Patrick Buchanan. Benny Nolan was hired by the RNC in May 1970 to direct the letter-writing campaign, and during this time, Nolan reported to RNC officials and to Jeb Magruder at the White House through his aides, including Gordon Strachan and Ron Baukel. Ideas for letters came from Magruder's staff from the RNC Office of Communication and from news stories that Nolan read. Letters were prepared, except for signatures, by Ms. Nolan and then distributed to volunteers in Washington and throughout the country who signed the letters and then sent them in as personal letters to the addressees designated by the RNC. During the first weeks of the letter-writing program, Nolan was unable to find individuals willing to sign the ghosted letters. Nolan recalled that someone, she does not recall who, suggested that false names without addresses be used on the letters. Therefore, from May 1970 until sometime in July 1970, some falsely signed letters were sent to the newspapers. In July 1970, Gordon Strachan became Ms. Nolan's contact on the Magruder staff, and with advice from Strachan and help from young Republicans, 
nolan organized a network of people to sign and mail the prepared letters thus making false signatures unnecessary subsequent letter-writing campaigns were initiated to influence key journalists such as catherine graham eric severide and some newspapers such as the washington star in january or february nineteen seventy one Magruder assigned responsibility for the letter-writing campaign to Ron Bockel, a White House fellow. In a memorandum to Charles Colson on April 26, 1971, Bockel described the effort as a true undercover operation in which letters are printed as letters from private citizens. One girl at the RNC generates 30 to 35 letters per week, of which an average of two to three are printed. Bacol added that the program was expanding slowly, so the security of the program will not be breached. In February 1972, Betty Nolan began to organize the Committee to Re-elect the President's letter-writing campaign. Most of the early letters generated by the CRP focused upon the leading Democratic candidates. During the course of the campaign, about 50 letters a week were prepared and mailed to volunteers, with most of the letters in final form needing only a signature before being mailed to newspapers. After President Nixon announced on May 8, 1972, that the United States was going to mine Haiphong Harbor and resume the bombing of North Vietnam, the letters operation was an integral part of the massive public relations effort undertaken by the CRP to generate support for the President's policies. CRP's response to the President's announcement is outlined in a memorandum from Rob Ottle to John Mitchell, dated May 9, 1972. Ottle noted that Betty Nolan's letters to the editor apparatus began to crank up her troops, and we expect over 1,200 telegrams as a result of this operation. Gordon Liddy, then counsel to the Finance Committee to re-elect the President, wrote to John Mitchell on May 15, 1972, that Betty Nolan hit four of the senators with 195 letters. In addition, early yesterday morning she had over 70 letters sent to the New York Times protesting its May 10th editorial. All other staffers were instructed at the May 11th staff meeting to write similar letters to the Times. Rob Ottle, former director of administration for the CRP, testified before the select committee that the entire campaign apparatus that week went to work in support of what happened issues of newspapers running polls on the president's actions were bought en masse by the crp and the poll responses were mailed in to tilt the results toward the president in addition a full-page advertisement was placed in the new york times on may seventeenth nineteen seventy two by a group of citizens supporting the president's decision to mine Haiphong Harbor. This ad was paid for with $4,400 in cash from CRP and prepared by the November Group, the advertising arm of the CRP. Charles Colson admitted that he reviewed the draft and probably made changes in it to the GAO. Neither the source of funds nor the group that actually wrote the advertisement was indicated in the body of the advertisement itself, an apparent violation of 18 U.S.C. 612, the criminal statute governing publication of political statements. Finally, as part of CRP's campaign to generate support for the president's actions, Howard Hunt called Donald Segretti in Los Angeles on May 8, 1972. Hunt said... The president was about to take very decisive action in Vietnam and asked Segretti to put together support for the president's policies to counter the expected reaction of the peace groups. Segretti called his main operatives in Florida, Robert Benz and Doug Kelly, and instructed them to set up tables for people to sign telegrams to the White House supporting the president. Segretti sent two telegrams to the White House that contained several hundred false signatures. None of the individuals whose names were on the telegrams had, in fact, approved of the use of his or her name. President's Interest It is significant to note that a March 9, 1970 memorandum to Magruder from Haldeman succinctly characterized the President's interest in such activities. Haldeman asked Magruder to prepare for him, once every two weeks, a summary of the various hatchet-man operations, 
letter to the editors counter-attack etc so that i can report to the president on the activity in this regard three direct mailing at the request of the white house office of communication the rnc built a series of mailing lists for editors media governors congressmen and political figures which were made available to offices at the white house as well as the rnc beginning in mid-1970 direct mail requests were received usually from herb klein's office but as the presidential campaign progressed charles colson's office began ordering more direct mailings from its formation the committee to re-elect the president also utilized rnc mailing facilities for the reproduction and distribution of political materials the primary deceptive practice found in the direct mail operation was the concealment of the true source of some of the letters and mailings that were distributed some letters were distributed that were printed on private or business stationery of the individuals involved but the letters failed to acknowledge that the costs of preparation duplication and distribution were not borne by the individuals sending out the letter for example a letter from former senator george a smathers endorsing president nixon for re-election was sent out by the direct mail operation of the rnc to thousands of individuals written instructions to diana burns the individual in charge of the direct mailing operation directed her to change the letter in any manner necessary to alter its appearance beyond identification as coming from rnc other examples of distribution without mention of a source were also found a reprint of a newspaper article indicating that representative pete mccloskey would consider backing a third-party candidate was set up with mailroom specifications indicating that the article should be mailed in plain number no. ten envelopes with commemorative or unusual stamps to disguise the source of the mailing to top newspaper and political figures another example of a disguised source of distribution was the reproduction of an international brotherhood of teamsters news service press release reporting the executive board endorsement of president nixon for re-election one thousand copies of this release were mailed by the rnc in plain hand-addressed envelopes such procedures to disguise the true source of these direct mailings would appear to violate the spirit if not the letter of the law as defined in the united states code title eighteen section six twelve which provides section six twelve publications or distribution of political statements whoever willfully publishes or distributes or causes to be published or distributed or for the purpose of publishing or distributing the same knowingly deposits for mailing or delivery or causes to be deposited for mailing or delivery or except in cases of employees of the postal service in the official discharge of their duties knowingly transports or causes to be transported in interstate commerce any card pamphlet circular poster dodger advertisement writing or other statement relating to or concerning any person who has publicly declared his intention to seek the office of president or vice president of the united states or senator or representative in or delegate or resident commissioner to congress in a primary general or special election or convention of a political party or has caused or permitted his intention to do so to be publicly declared which does not contain the names of the persons associations committees or corporations responsible for the publication or distribution of the same and the names of the officers of each association committee or corporation shall be fined not more than one thousand dollars or imprisoned not more than one year or both four citizens committees another aspect of the white house public relations program was the establishment of special citizens committees to generate support for the president on specific issues executive directors for these committees were usually found in the washington area and financial supporters were recruited by the white house financial support for the citizens committees came from many prominent contributors however the white house role in establishing and operating these citizens committees was never publicly acknowledged advertisements supporting the president were edited sometimes written and reviewed by individuals in the white house 
brief descriptions follow of some of the citizens committees established through white house efforts a tell it to hanoi committee the tell it to hanoi committee was organized after president nixon's announcement of the invasion of cambodia in may nineteen seventy financial support came from jack mulcahy a heavy contributor to the nineteen seventy presidential campaign and its chairman was william j pat o'hara a new york attorney numerous memorandums attest to the close relationship between this independent citizens committee and the white house invoices for services from the advertising agency placing the ads were forwarded to jeb magruder at the white house but magruder says they were paid for by the citizens committee and not from white house funds in a may fifth nineteen seventy memorandum to the president magruder reported that the tell it to hanoi committee had placed advertisements in more than forty newspapers and sent more than a million pieces of mail asking for public support none of the advertisements identified the role of the white house in preparing this information b citizens committee to safeguard america this group was formed to support the president's policies on the proposed anti-ballistic missile system and was responsible for placing a number of full-page newspaper advertisements supporting the ABM system. Haldeman wrote to Magruder on August 6, 1970, that President Nixon was especially pleased with the Safeguard ad, and that whoever had written it should be complimented. A handwritten note on the bottom of the memorandum by Rob Ottle says, Colson says he did it. The value to the White House of such independent citizens committees is clear. They provided a means of persuading the populace to support administration policies without identifying the White House backing for them, and more importantly, they created the impression that independent groups supported White House policies. Another advantage of these independent citizens committees was illustrated in a December 1, 1970 memorandum on political polling from Larry Higby to Herb Klein. To make the White House sponsored polls effective, Higby stated, We need other organizations that we can hang the polls on that will have credibility. A list of possible independent groups that could be used for polling was attached to the memorandum. It included the Tell It to Hanoi Committee and the Committee for a Responsible Congress, both creations of the White House. The success of the Tell It to Hanoi Committee and the Committee to Safeguard America led to the formation by the White House of Citizens Committees to attack key senatorial candidates in the 1970 congressional elections. In a June 17, 1970, memorandum to Jeb Magruder, Larry Higby urged the formation of Citizens Committees to run advertisements attacking Senate opponents of the administration. C. Committee for a Responsible Congress one such group was the Committee for a Responsible Congress. Jeb Magruder said that a series of negative ads aimed at the radical liberals in Congress was proposed by Charles Colson, who prepared much of the copy, and the ads were placed by the Committee for a Responsible Congress. Carl Shipley, a Republican National Committeeman, was enlisted by White House staff as the treasurer of this committee. Shipley recruited six other people to serve on the committee, giving them his word that it was a legitimate request and that he was calling at the instruction of the white house none of the committee members ever solicited or contributed any money in support of the advertisements shipley said he first saw the copy for the ads that were placed at a meeting in the executive office building attended by bagruder and colson representatives of an advertising agency and possibly haldeman or ehrlichman neither he nor any of the other committee members was ever contacted as to the content or target of the advertising. D. Committee for the Congress of 1970 The Committee for the Congress of 1970 were similarly established to place a series of positive advertisements supporting congressional candidates favorable to the Nixon administration. Its treasurer was Alexander Lankler, the former state chairman of the Maryland Republican Party. Lankler recalled that he was called by Charles Colson and asked if he would lend his name to a series of political advertisements. Money for the advertisement was given to Lankler by the White House and forwarded by him to Iyer Jorgensen McDonald, Incorporated, 
the same advertising agency that handled the tell it to hanoi account lankler does not recall who delivered the cash to him although he did recall that eighty thousand dollars in cash was received via colson's authorization despite their lack of success in the nineteen seventy congressional elections the white house public relations people favored the formation of citizens committees in the nineteen seventy two presidential election rob ottle discussing campaign organization in an october twenty ninth nineteen seventy one memorandum to the attorney general reviewed the work of committee like tell it to hanoi and suggested other citizens committees that could be used in the nineteen seventy two campaign patrick buchanan in a march fourteenth nineteen seventy two memorandum to john mitchell also recommended that citizens committees be established to attack political opponents buchanan suggested the following scenario soon after the democratic convention there be established one general committee with an odd sounding name and other committees tailored to specific issues i e united states security council which can then be mailed in bulk to GOP or citizens groups for distribution in target states. Chuck Colson's shop could have such, one imagines, established in a matter of hours. The specific committee should zero in on issues, depending on the Democratic candidate, where the opposition is especially vulnerable. For example, were Muskie the nominee, we would have a committee on the defense of the United States, one on space, one on aid to non-public schools, etc., the citizens campaign in nineteen seventy two consisted of numerous committees ranging from the massachusetts lawyers committee for the re-election of the president to nursing homes for nixon agnew two examples are discussed below e labor for america committee charles colson requested the formation of a dummy committee as a vehicle through which a mailing to labor could be funded in October 1972, a registration form and statement of organization was submitted to the General Accounting Office, GAO, for the Labor for America Committee, which stated that the committee supported President Nixon's re-election. The committee's address was a local post office box rented by Mrs. Miles Ambrose, wife of the former Commissioner of Customs. In its filing with the GAO, the Labor Committee indicated receipt of a $4,400 contribution from the SCRP. This money was used to reprint a brochure entitled Why Labor Can't Support George McGovern, which was a reproduction of an unsigned pamphlet circulated at the Democratic National Convention attacking McGovern's voting record on issues affecting labor. The reprinting and distribution of this pamphlet by a purportedly labor-affiliated organization enhanced the credibility of the contents. Were the same charges to have been published directly by the committee to re-elect the president, the impact of the charges would have been diminished. F. Citizens for a Liberal Alternative There were also citizens' committees which had no members at all. The Citizens for a Liberal Alternative was such a dummy committee. In the late fall of 1971, Bart Porter stated that Jeb Magruder told him to contact Ken Kachigian, a White House speechwriter, about a pamphlet the White House wanted distributed. Magruder instructed Porter to have the pamphlet printed and mailed to a group of leading liberals. While Ken Kachigian prepared the pamphlet in the White House, the pamphlet purported to be from the Citizens for a Liberal Alternative. The pamphlet attacked Senator Muskie on a variety of issues, thus appearing to come from a group of liberal Democrats. According to Kachigian, Pat Buchanan edited Kachigian's draft before it was printed in final form. Porter received the final draft from Kachigian and asked Tom Bell, a staff member of the Young Voters for the President, to have 1,000 copies printed up in 72 hours. All the negatives from the pamphlet were returned to Porter because of the secrecy Porter demanded. Following Magruder's directions, Porter had the pamphlet mailed to about 400 liberals around the country. A plan for Roger Greaves, Sedan Chair One, to distribute some of the pamphlets at a musky fundraising dinner in Beverly Hills fell through when the dinner was canceled. This bogus pamphlet also found its way to the New Hampshire primary. In February 1972, 
porter instructed roger stone a scheduler at crp to fly to new hampshire with a copy of the pamphlet and to place it in the headquarters of senator george mcgovern stone left the pamphlet on a table in the mcgovern headquarters in manchester new hampshire and then went to the offices of the manchester union leader where he told the political editor that he had found literature in the mcgovern headquarters stone said he expressed outrage to the editor that the mcgovern campaign was capable of printing such trash burl bernhard senator muskie's campaign manager testified that the pamphlet from the citizens for a liberal alternative appeared in a number of different places in new hampshire finally donald segretti received five hundred to one thousand copies of this same pamphlet some time after the florida primary and sent them to some of his agents who presumably distributed them end of section fourteen Section 15 of the Watergate Report, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Bjornsson. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 1. 2. 1972 Campaign. A. Political Strategy. The political strategy of the Committee to Re-elect the President in early 1971 and 1972 was unambiguous. Undercut Senator Muskie in the Democratic primaries, divide the Democratic Party so that it could not unite after the convention, and assist where possible in getting the weakest Democratic candidate nominated. The absence of a serious fight for renomination gave the CRP and the White House the luxury of focusing their political efforts during this period on potential Democratic opponents rather than serious primary contenders within their own party. In the meantime, the various Democratic contenders had to concentrate their own political efforts on obtaining their party's nomination. The Nixon strategy was best embodied in a series of political memorandums written by speechwriter Patrick Buchanan and his assistant Ken Kachigian. The early concern with Senator Muskie resulted from a series of public opinion polls in April, May, and June of 1971, which showed Senator Muskie leading both President Nixon and Governor Wallace in a three-way race. Buchanan outlined the Muskie strategy in a lengthy memorandum to President Nixon on March 24, 1971. Buchanan proposed creating a Muskie Watch, an operation working perhaps within the Republican National Committee, which may even be a publicized operation, doing constant research on Ed Muskie and putting out materials to interest groups and to the press. A few months later, Buchanan wrote, Thus, Senator Muskie is target A as of midsummer for our operation. Our specific goals are A, to produce political problems for him right now, B, to hopefully help defeat him in one or more of the primaries, Florida looks now to be the best early bet, California the best later bet, and C, finally, to visit upon him some political wounds that will not only reduce his chances for nomination, but damage him as a candidate should he be nominated. The strategy Buchanan advocated was to force Muskie to take more stands on controversial issues and to have President Nixon attack Muskie on those issues that divide Democrats. The anti-Muskie plan involved much negative campaigning against the senator rather than positive campaigning on behalf of President Nixon. In addition, such a strategy would subject Muskie to the pressures and harassments that go with being a frontrunner, pressures and harassments he is not getting today. In addition, Buchanan advocated concentrating on dividing the Democrats so that they would be unable to unite for the general election. In a July 2, 1971 memo, Buchanan advised, We maintain as guiding political principle that our great hope for 1972 lies in maintaining or exacerbating the deep democratic rift between the elite, chic, new left, intellectual, avant-garde, isolationist, bell-bottomed environmentalist, new priorities types on the one hand, and the hard-hat Dick Daly, Holy Name Society, ethnic, blue-collar, Knights of Columbus, NYPD, Queens Democrats, on the other. The liberal Democrats should be pinioned to their hippie supporters. The Humphrey Democrats should be reminded of how they were the fellows who escalated and cheered the war from its inception. This attack strategy of dividing the opposition was a main tenet of political faith both at the White House and the CRP throughout the 1972 campaign. 
By April 12, 1972, Buchanan observed, Our primary objective to prevent Senator Muskie from sweeping the early primaries, locking up the convention in April, and uniting the Democratic Party behind him for the fall, has been achieved. Further on, in the same memorandum, Buchanan rhetorically raised the question of whom do we want to run against? Buchanan's clear choice was Senator George McGovern. Later in April, Buchanan noted, we must do as little as possible at this time to impede McGovern's rise. The above strategy, while not improper in itself, was ultimately converted by others into the dirty tricks outlined below. The various operatives and agents of the White House and the CRP also had three major objectives in the 1972 campaign, to weaken Senator Muskie, to divide the Democrats, and to nominate the weakest Democratic candidate. The absence of primary opponents for President Nixon allowed his political strategists to target their efforts on the Democrats. The abundance of money in the CRP allowed the political operatives to set up a concerted effort to infiltrate and interfere with the Democratic primaries. The result was a campaign to re-elect President Nixon that was filled with illegal, improper, and unethical activity, much of which is described below. B. Implementation of White House and CRP Strategy 1. Donald Segretti A. Hiring in early 1971, George Strachan and Dwight Chapin, both staff aides in the White House working for H.R. Haldeman, discussed the need for a non-Colson dirty tricks operation in the field for the 1972 campaign. Strachan said that Chapin explained that he and Buchanan had been involved in some 1968 campaign pranks such as a false mailing sent out in the New Hampshire primary, but that it would be a good idea if the operation were moved from the White House in 1972. As a result, a meeting held in the early summer of 1971 among Chapin, Strachan, Buchanan, Kachigian, and Ron Walker, head of White House Advance Operations, to discuss how to structure a political prankster operation in the field for the 1972 campaign. Buchanan testified that he advised the group that it should be a small operation and that because of 1971, it ought to be under the committee to re-elect the president. Strachan and Chapin agreed that Donald Segretti, an old college friend of theirs from USC, would be a good candidate for the job of pulling pranks to disrupt the Democratic presidential primary campaigns. Segretti was first contacted by Dwight Chapin in the spring of 1971 about possible employment following his release from the Army. Segretti at that time expressed some interest in a possible job, since both his friends worked in the White House and since he thought that the job might include exciting work. Segretti stayed in touch with Chapin and Strachan during the next few months and flew to Washington, D.C. to meet with them in late June 1971. Segretti met with Chapin and Strachan twice on this visit, once at dinner at Chapin's house and again the following day at lunch. At these meetings, Strachan and Chapin explained to Segretti that his job would be to perform political pranks that would aid in the re-election of President Nixon. Segretti was given $400 in cash from Gordon Strachan to cover his expenses for this trip. Strachan and Chapin also cautioned Segretti not to discuss this matter with anyone else if he were not interested. But Segretti expressed great interest in the job, but since it seemed to involve exciting work, and after this meeting he began to contact old friends about the possibility of doing some work for the Nixon campaign. Meanwhile, Strachan and Chapin obtained Haldeman's approval for the project to ensure that Segretti could be paid from leftover 1968 campaign funds. Mr. Haldeman specifically approved having a person in the field to disrupt the Democratic primary campaigns and specifically approved the hiring of Mr. Segretti. In late August 1971, Haldeman and Strachan met with Herbert Kalmbach. Strachan testified that Haldeman directed Kalmbach to pay the salary and expenses of Segretti. Strachan then told Segretti to contact Herbert Kalmbach in Newport Beach, California for the purpose of finalizing his employment. Segretti met Kalmbach in late August 1971 and was offered a salary of $16,000 a year plus expenses for his activities. Segretti said he was not sure if he was to be working for Mr. Kalmbach, Mr. Chapin, or others. Following his meeting with Kalmbach, Segretti had lunch with Dwight Chapin not far from the Western White House in San Clemente, California. During this meeting, Chapin gave Segretti a list of cities and states on which to concentrate in the upcoming presidential primary campaigns. Segretti said that Chapin stressed to him the secrecy of his duties, 
and said that his activities would be focused on fostering a split among the various Democratic candidates to prevent the Democratic Party from uniting behind one candidate after the convention. Chapin also emphasized to Segretti the importance of having media impact in Segretti's activities. For example, Segretti said Chapin suggested that he have pickets with Humphrey signs at Muskie rallies. Segretti said Chapin also suggested putting out phony press releases. Chapin emphasized to Segretti that he should focus his efforts on Senator Edwin Muskie, the Democratic frontrunner at that time. Segretti said that Chapin further explained that his objective should be to give the president his best chance for re-election in November 1972 by seriously weakening the leading Democratic candidate, Senator Edmund Muskie. If that could be accomplished, the Democrats would have a bitter fight over the nomination and would never be able to recover in time for the general election. The alternative objective of Segretti's activities was to divide the Democratic candidates among themselves to create bitterness and mistrust among the Democrats. Following this meeting with Chapin in California, Segretti began contacting old friends of his in California and elsewhere about doing political work in the upcoming campaign. After his release from the Army on September 13, 1971, Segretti received a telephone call from Dwight Chapin. Chapin informed Segretti that Strachan would no longer be involved in the operation. Chapin also explained to Segretti that they would leave messages for one another under the aliases of Don Morris for Segretti and Bob Duane for Chapin. At Chapin's request, Segretti flew to Washington, D.C. and met Chapin in the dining room of the Hay Adams. At that meeting, Chapin suggested to Segretti that he get both a post office box where he could receive mail from Chapin and an answering service so that he could be reached at all times. In addition, Segretti said Chapin gave him a list of the 1968 advancement from Nixon's presidential campaign so that Segretti could begin making contacts in the appropriate primary states. Segretti testified that Chapin stressed he should not say or do anything which would link his activities to Chapin, the White House, the Republican Party, or the committee to re-elect the president. Chapin also gave Segretti the name of Ward Turnquist, an old high school friend of Chapin's as a possible contact in Southern California. Chapin directed Segretti to fly to Portland, Oregon the following day, preceding the president's visit there, to observe a presidential advance. Segretti flew to Portland on September 24, 1971, and stayed at the Benson Hotel. There, he was able to familiarize himself with the advance operation and the means used to handle demonstrators. On the morning of Sunday, September 26, Segretti met with Chapin in Segretti's room at the hotel. At that time, Chapin gave Segretti a copy of the advancement's manual, and they had further general discussions about Segretti's activities. After his meeting with Chapin, Segretti returned to Los Angeles and received his first payment from Kalmbach, a check for $5,000 as an advance on his expenses, and a check for $667 for his two-week salary. Following the presidential appearance in Portland, Chapin wrote Segretti a memorandum which said, From now on, we want to have at least one musky sign in among demonstrators who are demonstrating against the president. It should be Muskie for president and should be held in a location so that it is clearly visible. At Muskie events or events by other Democratic hopefuls, there should be a sign or two which goads them. For example, at a Muskie rally, there should be a large, why not a black vice president? Or perhaps we prefer Humphrey or something else that would goad him along. At Humphrey rallies, there should be Muskie signs, and at Kennedy rallies, there should be Muskie or Humphrey signs, and so on. These signs should be well placed in relationship to the press area so that a picture is easy to get. B. Activities 1. Summary After his meeting with Dwight Chapin at the Benson Hotel in Portland, Segretti set off across the country to recruit individuals to infiltrate and disrupt the upcoming Democratic presidential primaries. Segretti traveled to more than 16 states and contacted at least 80 individuals in his efforts to establish an organization that was capable of dividing the Democrats during their primaries. Segretti received $45,336 from Herbert Kalmbach in the period from September 29, 1971 until March 23, 1972. Of this total, Segretti had expenses of more than $22,000 and almost $9,000 of these expenses went to 22 individuals that Segretti had contacted during his travels. Segretti's objective in making contacts was to organize a network of agents in the following states, New Hampshire, Florida, Illinois, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, California, New Jersey, New York, and Texas. 
Almost all of these states had presidential primaries in 1972, and they were listed for Segretti when he met with Chapin at San Clemente in the late summer. 2. Relationship with Chapin During the early period of his travels, Segretti kept in fairly close contact with Dwight Chapin. For example, Segretti called Chapin 33 times in November, December, and January. Segretti used the pseudonyms of Don Durham and Don Simmons since Chapin had strongly advised to him to maintain secrecy in his operation and to divorce totally the White House and his activities. During these first few months' activities, Segretti occasionally received information and directions from Chapin. For example, Chapin informed Segretti when Senator Muskie would be in Los Angeles in November 1971 and asked him to line up some pickets for the appearance. Later on, Segretti said he was told by Chapin that Senator Muskie would be appearing at Whittier College and was asked by Chapin to provide pickets and hecklers in the crowd. A few days later, Segretti arranged for pickets outside of a San Francisco hotel where Senators Muskie and Humphrey were appearing at a Democratic dinner. Following Senator Muskie's appearance at Whittier College in November 1971, Segretti received in the mail a copy of the White House news summary from Chapin, which said, Reynolds said that he, Muskie, had come prepared for conservative questions, but the Chicanos gave him no chance, and Big Ed proved that he can keep his cool. Penciled in on the side of the copy is a note from Chapin which reads, Note, we really missed the boat on this. Obviously, the press now wants to prove E.M. can keep his temper. Let's prove he can't. In early November 1971, Chapin instructed Segretti to travel to New Hampshire and begin work since it was the first primary state. Chapin also gave Segretti the name of Alan Walker, chairman of the New Hampshire Committee to re-elect the president. Segretti said that Walker seemed very receptive to his ideas, and that he felt so much at ease with Walker that he gave him his true name. Shortly thereafter, Segretti received a phone call from Dwight Chapin who told him to leave New Hampshire immediately. Segretti traveled to Washington and met with Chapin in Segretti's hotel room. Chapin told Segretti to stay out of New Hampshire, move on to Florida, and never again use his real name. Chapin had general knowledge of much of Segretti's activities. Segretti testified that most of the literature, bumper stickers, and false letters that were distributed by Segretti were sent to Chapin's home in Washington after they were printed up. In addition, Segretti sent newspaper clippings to Chapin concerning his field activities as well as handwritten notes explaining his activities of the previous week. Chapin's reactions to Segretti's activities were always very positive, and Segretti has no recollection of the issue of the legality of Segretti's activities ever being discussed with Chapin. Segretti specifically recalls sending Chapin the Muskie busing poster, the sex smear letter on Muskie stationery against Senators Jackson and Humphrey, and the Humphrey press release about Shirley Chrisholm, all discussed below. During the months of December, January, and February, Segretti raised many doubts in the minds of people that he was recruiting. Many of these individuals, young Republicans, college Republicans, and young voters for the president, relayed messages back to Bart Porter, Tom Bell, and Ken Reitz at the CRP, who in turn sent the messages on to Jeb Magruder. Generally, the complaints were that there was an individual in the field who was causing serious problems for the committee to re-elect the president. Such a complaint was sent from J. Tim Grass of Madison, Wisconsin, to Carl Rove, president-elect of the College Republicans. This complaint was eventually assigned to Anthony Ulasowicz, who flew out to Wisconsin to investigate this mysterious individual. Ulasowicz did not succeed in tracking down Zagretti, but while he was out in Wisconsin, he received a call from Jack Caulfield, who informed him that Segretti worked for CRP. Many of these complaints about Segretti were sent to Magruder, who wrote a memorandum to John Mitchell in January 1972 entitled Matter of Potential Embarrassment, in which he described this individual in the field and urged that the individual should be placed under the direction of G. Gordon Liddy. After receiving a copy of that memorandum, H.R. Haldeman told Gordon Strachan to call Segretti to tell him to expect a call from Liddy, who would give him instructions in the future. This memorandum, describing the matter of potential embarrassment, was shredded following the Watergate break-in by Strachan and Haldeman's directions, according to Strachan's testimony. Segretti was told by Dwight Chapin in either a phone call or at their meeting in Washington on January 20, 1972, that some people in Washington had been disturbed by some of the problems that Segretti had caused in New Hampshire and Wisconsin. Chapin told Segretti to expect a call from an individual who would be checking up on his activities. 
3. Relationship with Hunt and Liddy In late January 1972, Liddy told Howard Hunt that a Democrat was trying to infiltrate Republican headquarters in some of the primary states in the upcoming campaign. Liddy sent out a communique to all the state committees to reelect the president headquarters with the individual's description in an effort to find the person who was engaging in these counterproductive activities. Four or five days later, Liddy came back to Hunt and said that he had stepped on some toes since the individual really worked for the committee to reelect the president. Shortly thereafter, Liddy told Hunt that he had been asked to evaluate Segretti's work by the people for whom Segretti was working. Hunt also testified that Liddy told him that Segretti's principals wanted Hunt and Liddy to keep tabs on this individual as well as to provide assistance if it did not hazard their own operations. A few days after his conversations with Chapin, Segretti received a call in California from an Ed Warren, Howard Hunt, who asked to meet with Segretti as soon as possible. On February 11, 1972, Segretti traveled to Miami, and on the following day, two men came to Segretti's motel room to meet him. They introduced themselves as Ed Warren and George Leonard. Hunt immediately turned on the television set in Segretti's room to prevent surreptitious taping of the meeting. Segretti explained to Hunt and Liddy that his activities consisted primarily of providing pickets at appearances by opposition candidates and distributing bogus pamphlets and leaflets that can embarrass the Democrats. Hunt and Liddy advised Segretti to use false identification, but they never provided any for him. In addition, Hunt provided Segretti with the name of Jose Ariola to do Segretti's printing in the Miami area. Segretti explained that he was having some difficulty in obtaining Senator Muskie's schedules, and so Hunt agreed to furnish this information to Segretti. In addition, Hunt gave Segretti his telephone number and told him to keep in touch. After this initial meeting of 10 to 15 minutes, Segretti maintained sporadic contact with Hunt. Occasionally, Hunt would make suggestions to Segretti about possible activities. Some of these suggestions are listed below in the pages describing specific activities carried out by Segretti and his associates. Segretti's last meeting with Howard Hunt was on June 9, 1972 at the Sheraton Foreign Ambassadors Hotel in Miami, Florida. At this meeting, Hunt suggested that Segretti put together a group of peaceful demonstrators to pick at the Doral Hotel during the Democratic Convention. Hunt explained that another group of unruly demonstrators was to join in the demonstration and attempt to disrupt it, and that the bad conduct of the crowd would be blamed on Senator McGovern. However, the Watergate break-in occurred on June 17, 1972, and any plans for the convention by E. Howard Hunt were temporarily quashed. End of Section 15 Section 16 of the Watergate Report, Volume 1. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Final Report of the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities, Volume 1. 4. Primary Activities Segretti's most successful operation in the Democratic primaries was in Florida, where he recruited Bob Benz to head up the operation in Tampa, and Doug Kelly to help him in Miami. Segretti paid Benz $2,417 for his activities, and sent Kelly $3,436 for his help. Segretti was also fairly successful in recruiting people for the California primary. These individuals included James Robert Norton, who obtained an answering service for Segretti in East St. Louis, and a number of other individuals with expertise in state politics that Segretti could rely on to distribute literature and to harass appearances by Democratic candidates. In addition, Segretti recruited Tom Visney and Charles Svillick to create problems for the Democrats in Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin, and Skip Zimmer and Bob Neely for work in the Pennsylvania primary. Finally, Segretti enlisted the help of Michael Martin Jr. for the New York primary, and Bobby Garner of Houston to provide help in Texas, if that state were to become crucial. The following account is a summary of the kinds of activities in which Segretti and his associates engaged during the 1972 campaign. A. Infiltrators, Florida One of the objectives that Chapin outlined to Segretti for his operations was to place infiltrators in Democratic primary campaigns to gather information and to create division among the Democratic candidates. When Robert Benz met Segretti for the first time, he was told to obtain hecklers, pickets, and also to get people to infiltrate into the campaigns to gather information, and that Segretti would provide money to pay these people. 
Benz immediately recruited Peg Griffin, a secretary in Tampa, active in Republican politics, and asked her to infiltrate the Muskie campaign. Benz testified that he told the Muskie people that she was a Republican, that she did not care for the president's policies, and that she was now a backer of Senator Muskie. Benz paid Ms. Griffin $75 a month to infiltrate the campaign. In exchange, Griffin provided Benz with campaign literature, information about the campaign strategy, stationery from Senator Muskie's campaign, names of the campaign staff and precinct captains for Senator Muskie, and some names of financial contributors. Benz testified that he in turn sent all of the information that he received from Ms. Griffin to Segretti's post office box in Los Angeles. Much of the information that Griffin was able to provide from the Muskie campaign headquarters was subsequently used to further many of the disruptive acts that were perpetrated in the Florida campaign. Griffin was also quite successful in disrupting the campaign on her own. For example, in early January 1972, she learned of a secret $1,000 a plate fundraising dinner for Senator Muskie following a public reception and added this information on as the last two lines of a press release from the Muskie campaign. The dinner was subsequently canceled by Senator Muskie because of the publicity it received. Benz testified he also recruited Ezeline Froelich to infiltrate the Jackson campaign in Florida. Froelich provided Benz with the same kind of information from Senator Jackson's campaign that Peg Griffin gathered from Muskie's. This information proved to be most valuable in conducting Benz's field activities. Benz attempted to recruit individuals to infiltrate the Humphrey and Wallace campaigns as well, but was unsuccessful in these efforts. Benz later traveled to Pennsylvania to recruit individuals to infiltrate the primary campaigns there, but he was not as successful as he had been in Florida. Segretti was also under the impression that Doug Kelly in Miami had two infiltrators into the Muskie campaign. However, Kelly consistently testified that he had no infiltrators or informants in any campaigns in Miami. California Segretti was also successful in recruiting infiltrators for the California primary. In the Los Angeles area, Segretti talked to Turnquist, Chapin's friend from high school, who in turn contacted Pat O'Brien and recruited him to work in the Muskie campaign in Los Angeles and report back any political intelligence. O'Brien was hired in December 1971 and worked part-time through April 1972 in the Muskie campaign. In San Francisco, Mike Silva was recruited by Bob Norton to obtain campaign intelligence from the Muskie headquarters and be a contact in San Francisco for Segretti. Silva told Segretti that he had placed two infiltrators in the Muskie campaign in late February 1972. Silva stated in an interview, however, that he did not actually place infiltrators in the campaign, but merely gathered campaign literature from a political science course at San Francisco State University and forwarded the material on to Segretti at his post office box in Los Angeles. New York In New York, Segretti hired Michael Martin Jr. to infiltrate the Humphrey campaign and report any intelligence information that he gathered. Martin apparently was such a successful infiltrator that he was offered a position as director of the Northern New York campaign for Humphrey, but Segretti said that Martin turned down the position so he could stay in New York City and continue reporting to Segretti. Texas In Texas, Segretti paid Bobby Garner of Houston $265, some of which was to go to an infiltrator in the Muskie campaign in Texas. This infiltrator was to work during the months of February, March, and April, gathering intelligence and mailing back to Segretti's post office box in Los Angeles. The success of the Segretti operation in infiltrating primary campaigns also contributed to the success of their other efforts to disrupt and harass Democratic candidates. B. Surveillance In his meeting with Dwight Chapin in early November 1971, Segretti learned that Senator Muskie would be visiting the Los Angeles area about November 6th. Segretti testified that Chapin instructed him to hire some pickets for Muskie's appearances there and to learn the logistics of Senator Muskie's traveling party. Segretti said he called Jess Burdick, an ex-CID agent who worked as a private detective in the Los Angeles area, and hired him to tail Senator Muskie during his trip to Los Angeles. Burdick followed Muskie for the weekend and reported back to Segretti information such as the license numbers of the vehicles used by the Muskie campaign. When Burdick charged Segretti $325 for his services, Segretti thought the price was steep for the information that was provided and therefore did not use Burdick after the one occasion in November. Physical surveillance of Senator Muskie also occurred in the Florida primary when Robert Benz had his agents tail Senators Muskie and Jackson when they were in the Tampa area. C. Disruptions I. Distribution of false and misleading literature 
One of the most successful tactics for disrupting the Democratic primary campaigns used by Segretti and his operatives was the distribution of false and misleading literature. Instances of this particular campaign abuse occurred in nearly every primary state. Nowhere in any of this literature was it noted that the literature was financed by funds from the Committee to Re-elect the President. Pre-primary After Segretti was informed by Dwight Chapin that Senator Muskie was appearing at Whittier College in November 1971, he had a number of handouts with hard questions printed up which he handed out to students at the Whittier rally. Someone in the crowd asked Muskie about his views on abortion, one of the questions on Segretti's handout. In the White House news summary of the event that Chapin sent Segretti, Chapin noted that Segretti's question had been asked. Florida False and misleading literature was most widely distributed in the Florida primary. The following list is a catalog of the various abuses in this area perpetrated in Florida by Segretti and his operatives. 1. About 300 red Dayglow posters were distributed throughout the state which said, Help Muskie in busing, sick, more children now. The poster was signed by the Mothers Backing Muskie Committee, a non-existent committee, and the intent of the poster was to identify Senator Muskie with a strong pro-busing position, a very unpopular issue in Florida. Most of these posters were distributed by Benz, Segretti, and Kelly in the Tampa and Miami areas of Florida. 2. About a thousand four by six inch cards were printed up and distributed at a Tampa rally for Governor George Wallace by Robert Benz and his agents. The cards read, If you liked Hitler, you'll just love Wallace. On the other side of the card, it stated, A vote for Wallace is a wasted vote. On March 14, cast your vote for Senator Edmund Muskie. There was no indication on the cards that they were financed by Nixon campaign funds. The clear intent of the literature was to drive a wedge between the Wallace and Muskie campaigns. 3. On February 25, 1972, a letter was sent on copied Muskie campaign stationery to the campaign manager of the Florida Jackson campaign and to syndicated columnists which stated that Senator Muskie's campaign was using government typewriters as well as government employees drawing government salaries. This letter was sent to Jackson campaign headquarters in Tampa and in Washington, D.C., and copies of the letter were also sent to local media. The facts on which the letter was based were totally fabricated by Segretti, and Doug Kelly and Bob Bentz arranged for the distribution of the letter on copied stationery Pat Griffin provided from the Muskie campaign. 4. Similarly, in March 1972, Segretti sent Bentz a counterfeit letter on Muskie stationery containing allegations of sexual improprieties involving Democratic presidential candidates Jackson and Humphrey. Segretti instructed Bentz to have 20 to 40 copies of the letter printed on Senator Muskie's stationery, which Segretti enclosed, and distributed. Bentz gave the material to George Hearing, a local recruit of Bentz, who duplicated the letter on Muskie's stationery and mailed the letter to supporters of Senator Jackson. Hearing's list of Jackson supporters was given to him by Bentz, who had obtained the information from Esaline Froelich, the infiltrator in Senator Jackson's campaign. This phony, scurrilous letter on Muskie's stationery against Senators Jackson and Humphrey won praise for Segretti from Chapin. On learning that the cost of the reproduction of the letter was only $20, Segretti testified that Chapin told him that for that small sum, he had obtained $10,000 to $20,000 worth of benefit for the president's re-election campaign. In May 1973, indictments concerning this incident were brought by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Tampa. At that time, Robert Bentz was given immunity and was not prosecuted, while George Hearing was prosecuted and convicted on one count of violating 18 U.S.C. 612, the law prohibiting distribution of unsigned political literature. Similarly, Donald Segretti was indicted for a number of violations of 18 U.S.C. 612. Mr. Hearing, the individual who mailed the letter, was sentenced to one year in prison. Mr. Segretti, the originator of the scheme, was sentenced to six months in prison after pleading guilty to three counts in federal district court in Washington, D.C. Robert Bentz, the individual who recruited Hearing and Froelich, and who directed Hearing to mail the letter, was neither indicted nor convicted of any crimes. 5. A number of pamphlets advertising a free lunch at Muskie's campaign headquarters were distributed in May by Doug Kelly. The pamphlets also advertised free liquor and a chance to meet Senator Muskie and his wife. These pamphlets were distributed all over Miami, and a small pile of them was left at the Lindsay headquarters. The morning before the lunch was to occur, Kelly called Muskie headquarters and said that the Lindsay campaign was responsible for the false invitations. 
The dual objectives of the literature were thus to disrupt the Muskie campaign and to drive a wedge between Lindsay and Muskie. 6. Another invitation to a Muskie campaign meeting in Miami was obtained from the Muskie campaign by Segretti and Kelly. A line was added to the invitation which stated, free food and alcoholic beverages provided, and these were distributed in the Miami area. 7. Some press releases were written on Muskie stationery in Miami by Doug Kelly, Segretti's main contact in the area. Kelly recalled sending out three or four bogus press releases, most of which sought to misrepresent the position of Senator Muskie on issues such as Israel and busing, and to draw attention to the position of Senator Humphrey. These releases were yet another tactic for carrying out the strategy of dividing the Democrats. 8. Kelly testified that he also distributed flyers announcing a speech by former Secretary of the Interior Udall that had been canceled by the Young Democrats. The flyers resulted in some disruption, Kelly testified, since the speech had to be rescheduled after the flyers appeared. 9. Flyers were passed out in Miami by Doug Kelly that appeared to be from Mayor Lindsay, which attacked Senator Muskie's stand on Israel. These flyers noted that Senator Muskie felt that Israel should be treated the same way as Cuba, thus antagonizing both Jewish and Cuban-American voters. Many of these flyers were distributed in Miami Beach by being placed under windshield wipers of cars that were parked at synagogues. 10. Other examples of false testimony passed out in the Florida primary by Segretti and his contacts are found in the exhibits introduced during the Segretti testimony. Wisconsin. Similar kinds of false and misleading literature were distributed in the Washington primary by Segretti and his agents. Segretti and Benz drove to Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the end of March 1972 to pull pranks before the April 4th primary. There, they distributed a false invitation for a free lunch with Senator Humphrey on April Fool's Day, at which free drinks were to be given away, and guests would have the opportunity to meet Senator Humphrey, Lauren Green, and Mrs. Martin Luther King. The invitation was intended to disrupt the Humphrey campaign, much as Segretti had done to Muskie in Florida. Benz also stated that he and Segretti called the local newspapers to inform them that the invitations had been printed by Muskie supporters. Numerous bumper stickers with derogatory sexual slogans about Senator Muskie were put up and distributed by Segretti and Benz in Wisconsin. They were intended to embarrass Senator Muskie and to help drive down his vote total in Wisconsin. The bumper stickers were again unidentified as to their source. Illinois. Much of the same material that was distributed in Wisconsin was also distributed in Illinois by Tom Visney, Segretti's main recruit there. In addition, Segretti sent Visney copies of the pamphlet from the Citizens for a Liberal Alternative, the non-existent Citizens Committee discussed earlier. This pamphlet, written in the White House and printed by CRP, was intended to divide the Democrats among themselves. District of Columbia On about April 13, 1972, Segretti testified that he flew to Washington at the suggestion of E. Howard Hunt, to organize disruptive activities at a Muskie fundraiser scheduled for April 17, 1972. Doug Kelly, who also flew up for the occasion, and Segretti distributed literature which described the fundraising dinner and requested pickets outside the dinner to protest the fat cats. California By the time of the California primary, the main Democratic contenders were Senator McGovern and Senator Humphrey. Most of the false and misleading literature distributed by Segretti and his contacts in California attacked one of the Democratic candidates and attributed the attack to another candidate, thus attempting to further divide the Democrats and make it more difficult for them to regroup following the convention. Months before the primary, Segretti reprinted a newspaper advertisement by Stuart Mott and the Committee for Honesty in Politics, which abhorred the secret money in presidential politics. At the bottom of the reprint, Segretti added the note, the committee will look for your names as part of Muskie's Fat Cats. They better be there. This doctored reprint was distributed to individuals entering a fundraiser for Senator Muskie in Los Angeles by Segretti's agents in the area. As the primary approached, the literature written and distributed by Segretti and his contacts became much more vicious. Some examples follow. 1. Segretti sent out a statement on Humphrey press release stationery for immediate release which said that Representative Shirley Chrisholm had been committed to a private home for the mentally ill from February 1951 until April 1952. The release went on to describe in the most vicious and scurrilous terms the alleged behavior that Representative Chris Holm demonstrated at that time. At the bottom of the fake press release were the initials HHH. 
This release was mailed out to 10 or 15 California newspapers. Segretti testified that he sent the release to Dwight Chapin, who laughed for a period of time about the bogus release. 2. Two other false press releases on Hubert Humphrey stationery were mailed out to the newspapers by Segretti. One release stated that former President Lyndon Johnson favored Humphrey as the Democratic nominee, and the other one misrepresented Humphrey's position on one of the initiatives on the California ballot in 1972. Most of the bogus candidate stationery that was used by Segretti to pull his so-called pranks was printed for him by Jose Arriola in Miami, the printer whose name Segretti received from Howard Hunt. 3. Segretti also had bumper stickers printed and distributed throughout California which said, Humphrey, he started the war, don't give him another chance. More than 1,000 of these bumper stickers were printed, most of which were distributed in California. The bumper stickers were signed by the Democrats for a Peace candidate, another non-existent group which was created by Segretti. 4. In addition, using as a model the pamphlet from the Citizens for a Liberal Alternative that had been drafted by Ken Kachigian and Pat Buchanan in the White House, Segretti had 3,000 pamphlets printed up with a picture of Senator Humphrey holding a large fish and the caption, Humphrey, a fishy smell for the White House? The objective of the pamphlet was to have the Humphrey people blame McGovern for this scurrilous, fictitious piece of literature. These pamphlets were distributed in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and in Orange County. 5. Segretti was also responsible for preparing and mailing a letter over the forged signature of Barbara Barron, the campaign coordinator of Senator McCarthy's California campaign, to McCarthy delegates and Chrisholm supporters urging them to shift their support to Senator Humphrey. This letter was printed on McCarthy 1972 stationery, and many of the people who received the mailing letter have always believed that Barbara Barron was responsible for the letter. In fact, Barbara Barron had absolutely nothing to do with the mailing since it was solely a product of Segretti's fertile imagination. 6. Segretti also sent letters on Yorty for President stationery to local newspapers such as the Los Angeles Free Press. These letters claimed that the forged letters from Barbara Barron to the McCarthy delegates and Chris Holmes supporters were the responsibility of the Yorty campaign. The Los Angeles Free Press ran the story that the forged letters had in fact come from the Yorty for President committee. Thus, the forged letters and the subsequent fake letter claiming responsibility for the initial forgeries were quite successful in sowing dissension among the California Democrats. According to Frank Mankiewicz, these examples of false literature distributed in the campaign had a serious impact on the Democratic candidates themselves. He testified, We, the McGovern campaign and the Humphrey campaign, were no longer opponents. We had become enemies, and I think largely as a result of this activity. In addition, Senator Muskie and his staff blamed the false and scurrilous literature on both Senator McGovern and his supporters as well as Senator Humphrey's campaign. The false literature exacerbated the normal differences among the candidates and helped to create a deeply divided Democratic Party at the close of the presidential primaries. 2. False Advertising Another deceptive practice engaged in by Segretti and his agents was the placement of false and misleading advertising for or against Democratic candidates on the radio and in local newspapers. Florida In Miami, Doug Kelly placed an ad on a local radio station which said that Senator Muskie believed in the right of self-determination for all people, and therefore supported the Castro government in Cuba. The ad was ostensibly purchased by the Muskie campaign organization and was designed by Kelly to alienate the Cuban voters from Senator Muskie. A similar ad was placed in the local Cuban-American newspaper Replica, which stated that Muskie believed that the United States should not interfere with the Castro government of Cuba. Again, the ad purported to be from Senator Muskie's campaign and was designed to alienate Cuban-American supporters. A number of classified ads were placed in various Miami newspapers which drew attention to Muskie's statement that he did not think the American people were ready for a black vice presidential candidate. While these small ads could hardly influence very many voters, the ads could create some division and bad feelings among the Democrats after the primary was over if Senator Muskie's campaign thought the ads were placed by other Democratic contenders. Illinois In Chicago, Tom Visney placed an anti-Muskie ad in the newspaper as well as on some of the radio stations. These ads supported Senator McCarthy's candidacy and stated that Senator Muskie had neither the emotional stability nor the experience to hold the office of the presidency. In none of these ads was it stated that they had been paid for and created by agents of the White House. Democratic Convention 
In May or June, Segretti and Doug Kelly ordered an airplane to fly over the Democratic convention with a trailer which stated, Peace, Pot, Promiscuity, Vote McGovern. Kelly was not sure if in fact the plane flew over the convention. Someone later told him that they had seen a plane with a weird message flying over the Democratic convention. 3. Pickets One of the main tenets of advice given to Segretti by Dwight Chapin was to have pickets appear at campaign appearances by other Democratic candidates in order to take advantage of the media coverage of the event. Therefore, much of Segretti's activity involved organizing pickets at the appearances of the Democratic primary contenders. Even prior to the primaries in early November 1971, Segretti paid a friend of his from Turlock, California to arrange for a group of pickets with signs saying Kennedy for President, to appear in front of a San Francisco hotel where both Senators Muskie and Humphrey were appearing at a Democratic dinner. Segretti also attempted to arrange for pickets to appear at an appearance by Senator Muskie at Whittier College that same month. Unknown to Segretti, Roger Greaves, Sedan Chair 1, had also been directed by Bart Porter and Jeb Magruder to have pickets present with anti-Muskie signs. The appearance must have been an important one since Segretti was given the same directions by Dwight Chapin at the White House. Florida Segretti's most successful picketing operation was run by Robert Bentz in the Tampa area during the Florida primary campaign. Bentz recruited Kip Edwards, Al Reese, George Hearing, and an individual identified only as Duke, to organize pickets against Senators Muskie and Jackson in the Tampa area. The logistics of the picketing was greatly aided by the information being provided to Benz by Froelich from the Jackson campaign and Griffin from the Muskie campaign. Many of these picketing activities were successful in getting media coverage and in provoking dissension among the Democratic candidates. These activities included 1. Benz learned that Senator Jackson was to appear for the opening of his Tampa headquarters in January 1972. As a result, he hired a Mr. Yancey and Kip Edwards to stand across the street from the headquarters with signs saying, Believe in Muskie. Segretti was present to observe this particular demonstration, as were some news photographers who took a picture of Senator Jackson walking across the street to offer the two picketers a glass of orange juice. This photograph was reprinted widely in Florida newspapers. 2. Benz also received the schedule of the Muskie campaign train as it traveled down through Florida. He arranged for pickets to appear at the Winter Haven stop with signs saying Wallace Country. George Hearing, Kip Edwards, and the individual known as Duke showed up to picket this appearance. Ben believed that Duke was a member of the Nazi party and was told that he was a former SS officer in Hitler's stormtroopers. In addition, Benz and Hearing discussed the possibility of disrupting Senator Muskie's train schedule by furnishing false information to his headquarters as well as to the public. 3. Benz also arranged for pickets to appear at another Muskie appearance at the University of Southern Florida. There, they distributed derogatory newspaper reprints concerning Muskie. 4. Benz organized a number of other pickets at Muskie appearances in Tampa. On one occasion, he arranged for the picketing of a Muskie rally by blacks carrying racially related placards, which criticized Muskie's statements about not having a black vice presidential candidate. 5. On one occasion, Doug Kelly gave a female college student from the University of Florida $20 in cash to run naked in front of Muskie's hotel in Gainesville, screaming, Senator Muskie, I love you. Kelly testified that the incident was reported in the Gainesville papers. 6. Senator Muskie had a press conference in Miami at the Four Ambassadors Hotel shortly before the Florida primary. Kelly recruited some Cubans to picket the press conference with signs saying, Muskie, go home, and we want a free Cuba. In addition, Kelly gave the picketers Humphrey buttons to wear. One of Senator Muskie's aides asked Kelly about the identity of the picketers. Kelly explained to him confidentially that the picketers were really working for Senator Jackson. This example is a good case of how political pranks can be used both to identify a candidate with a controversial issue and to foster dissension among the Democratic candidates themselves. California. In California, Segretti contacted many people to picket fundraising dinners by Democratic candidates as well as distribute false literature. For example, Segretti hired an individual named Jim Popovich, who told Segretti that he would put together a flying squad of about 10 individuals who would be available to picket any local appearances by Senator Muskie. Segretti thought the idea a good one and paid Popovich about $130 before discovering that Popovich was not producing as many pickets for these appearances as he had claimed. Pennsylvania 
In Pennsylvania, Segretti recruited Skip Zimmer and Bob Neely to pass out literature at Muskie campaign appearances and to organize pickets for Muskie rallies. Zimmer sent Segretti clippings from local newspapers after Muskie's appearances where Muskie was heckled and picketed to verify that the activity occurred. Exhibits in the committee record indicate that Zimmer recruited people to stand at Muskie rallies with signs saying such things as M-U-S-K-I-E spells loser and H-H-H is the man. Posters also drew attention to Muskie's pro-busing stand and pointed out that he allegedly sent his children to private schools. As Zimmer described these efforts in a note to Zagretti, Though press was disappointing, we did gradually piss off his staff and rattle him considerably. Segretti also stated that Zimmer allegedly arranged for pickets to appear at Muskie rallies and pose with signs saying, Gaze for Muskie. Hecklers were also organized by Zimmer and Neely during the Pennsylvania primary, according to Segretti. Some hecklers appeared at one Humphrey speech in Philadelphia. Following the heckling, Segretti said that Zimmer called Humphrey headquarters to tell them that Muskie had hired the hecklers for $100 apiece. As noted earlier, Segretti also had Robert Benz fly to Pittsburgh to recruit agents to picket Muskie's campaign appearances. Benz was not as successful there as he had been in Tampa. Planned Convention Activity As discussed earlier, Segretti's recruiting of pickets for campaign appearances of Democratic candidates was supposed to reach its high point at the Democratic Convention in Miami during July 1972. Howard Hunt directed Segretti to set up a demonstration which would subsequently become violent and would be blamed on the McGovern campaign. The Watergate break-in, however, put an end to these plans. 4. Other Disruptions False Orders for Food, Flowers, and Beverages On primary day in Florida, Segretti and Kelly placed orders on behalf of the Muskie campaign for flowers, chicken, pizzas, and about $300 to $400 of liquor. Three weeks later, on the day of the Wisconsin primary, Segretti and Bentz again ordered flowers, chicken, and pizzas to be sent to Senator Muskie's hotel room, and also ordered two limousines to be sent to Senator Muskie's hotel for the use of the senator. These false orders disrupted Senator Muskie's schedule considerably. Finally, two weeks later at a Muskie fundraising dinner in Washington, D.C., Segretti and Kelly again made numerous false orders to disrupt the dinner. Kelly and Segretti ordered flowers, liquor, pizzas, and other items for the banquet charging them to the Muskie Campaign Committee. In addition, Kelly and Segretti invited six African ambassadors and their guests to attend the Muskie fundraising dinner and made arrangements for them to be picked up by limousines which were to be charged to Senator Muskie's campaign. These activities disrupted this last major fundraising effort by Senator Muskie by diverting his staff attention and resources, especially when Segretti and Kelly kept calling the limousine drivers to return to the Muskie dinner in order to be paid by the campaign. The net effect of their activities was to create a very embarrassing situation for the Muskie organization. Stink Bombs On at least four separate occasions in the Florida primary, stink bombs were used to disrupt or harass the Muskie campaign. The stink bomb was first concocted by a chemist friend of Doug Kelly. The name of the chemical substance which he produced was butyl percaptan, a foul-smelling substance which was not physically harmful but was very noxious. Shortly before the Florida primary, Senator Muskie had a campaign picnic scheduled in the Miami area. Kelly and Segretti took the chemical substance, put it in a Coke bottle, and sealed it with wax. The bottle was taken to the picnic by Kelly and Segretti and dropped on the ground, releasing the chemical substance to foul the air. After the stink bomb had been dropped, Kelly said that everybody thought that the food was bad, so it kind of made the picnic a bad affair. Following the Muskie picnic, Segretti traveled north to Tampa with three vials of butyl percaptan. Segretti gave these vials to Bob Benz with the instructions that they should be placed in Senator Muskie's headquarters. One of the vials was taken to a Muskie campaign picnic in the Tampa area and emptied on the grounds there. The other two vials were given to George Hearing by Benz with instructions to place them in the two Tampa headquarters of Senator Muskie on the evening before the primary. According to Benz, Hearing placed one of the stink bombs in the offices housing the telephone bank operation of Senator Muskie, and the other in the Tampa Muskie headquarters. Benz said that Hearing told him that at one location the material was dropped through a hole in the window, and at the other location the window was open and the stink bomb was tossed in. Segretti testified that he was told by Benz that a screen was pried open and a window lifted in order to place the stink bomb in the Muskie campaign headquarters. 
The placing of these stink bombs in the Muskie campaign headquarters on the evening prior to the Florida primary disrupted, confused, and unnecessarily interfered with the campaign for the office of the Presidency. Other Disruptions A few days before the Florida primary, Senator Muskie held a press conference at the Four Ambassadors Hotel. Doug Kelly walked into the Muskie press conference with a long overcoat on and dropped two white mice with blue ribbons on their tails which said, Muskie is a rat fink. Kelly also released a small finch which went flying around the room of the press conference and caused a great deal of commotion and disruption to Senator Muskie's press conference. Kelly also had advance notice of Muskie's schedule in Florida. As a result, Kelly would often call the individuals who were on Senator Muskie's schedule and change the hour of the appointment to some other time, or even cancel the appointment. Needless to say, this tactic greatly disconcerted both Senator Muskie and the press. Both Kelly and Benz made a practice of placing other Democratic candidates' stickers on the posters and literature of other Democrats. This practice was designed to foster divisions and bad feelings among the Democratic candidates. Kelly also attempted to tie up the phone banks of the Muskie campaign on the day of the Florida primary by dialing the telephone numbers of the Muskie phone bank operation from pay telephones. Kelly would then leave the telephone off the hook as soon as the call was answered at the Muskie campaign. He then left the phone booth and placed an out-of-order sign on the outside to ensure that the line would be tied up all day. The method, however, didn't work because of the automatic cutoff from the phone company. End of section 16